Even though we just digressed a little bit into talking about moral relativism, let's remember why we got there. Here's a slide that pointed out the problem that we have in trying to resolve uh, the moral, moral issues and moral dilemmas. Uh, the issue being that even for one and the same argument, some people claim it's right to kill or, or sacrifice a person in order to save five lives. And other people think that it's wrong to kill an innocent person, even if it saves five lives. These are clearly contradictory. Now, the point that I think is worth pursuing, and I think this is the way philosophers have pursued it, have pursued it, is that they've tried to put together moral theories that are intended to adjudicate between these two. That is, the question is, is that first moral principle, which is the first premise in one argument, true, or is that first premise of the fourth argument, which was also the second argument, true. If we can have a theory that could explain why one of them was true rather than the other, and we could show that this moral theory was a good theory of what makes things right or wrong, I think we'd have an answer to the question. So with this, I'd like to turn to kind of an overview of some moral theories that have been proposed by philosophers to answer this question. And now the question they're asking is, what makes an action, what makes a certain act right or wrong? So if you define what's right, by contrast, anything that isn't right is wrong. And when we were looking at cultural relativism a second ago, I think we have this fundamental principle of morality, this criterion of morality that would be that captures the essence of cultural relativism, and that is that an action is right if and only if it conforms to the standards of society. And we saw how that was intended to be used to try to at least reconcile our inconsistent moral principles. I'm not sure that it really answers our case because I don't think, you know, Cultures in general worry about the trolley problem. There is a very popular theory among religious people, mostly, known as the divine command theory. Divine as in divinity, God, command theory. And according to this theory, or at least its criterion of morality, fundamental principle is an action is right if and only if God commands the action. So, for example, you look on the side, one, one side of the Supreme Court, there's a, on, on the outside in that little triangular uh, uh, structure above the columns, and there's a picture of Moses holding the Ten Commandments. And the idea being that at least the, uh, the founders of the country and the, and the framers of, of our uh, government thought that it was to some extent, based on divine laws. That is, we uh, remember the Declaration of Independence, for example, or in it, Thomas Jefferson wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator. Okay, so they're, they're equal because they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That is, the things that are right or wrong are made so, or are, what makes the actions right is that God commands them, and what makes actions wrong is that God commands you not to do them. Now, if we're trying to take this kind of theory, at least and apply it in the trolley example, it's hard to see how to do it. Because... Does God command you to sacrifice five to save one? Or does he command you not to kill one innocent person? How do we understand that? And then there are a whole lot of other questions. So it's, it's hard to see how this determines what's the right answer in our, moral, our two moral dilemmas that we were talking about. But furthermore, if we think in general, there are kind of serious issues 
you might call them epistemological issues. It's how do you know what God commands and what doesn't command? Is it the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, the God of the Quran, the God of some Far Eastern holy, holy uh, scriptures? They, and these are these are um, a set of morals associated with these religions that there are conflicts between these. And furthermore, you know, that, that is, maybe there's a danger that somebody thinks that he actually knows what God is thinking. And people have done, and people have done some very extreme things, have done some pretty awful things, killing people, murdering people in cold blood, uh, etc., do, do, doing acts of terrorism, harming thousands of people, cutting people's heads off, etc., in the name of religion. And the question is, you know, which religion is it that's the right one? Because certainly, if you think about it, if there is a God, uh, we certainly don't have, we certainly don't think that the God is commanding people to do all kinds of what we uh, all kinds of heinous, all kinds of horrible actions. Uh, but nonetheless, people do that. So it, it's a little bit of a problem. But, you know, the truth of the matter is this could be right. The problem, this theory could be right. The problem is figuring out what it is that God wants you to do in each individual case. Now, you should know there's a very famous argument called the Euthyphro argument that's attributed to Socrates by Plato in the dialogue. Euthyphro is the Greek name of a character that uh, is that that. Socrates in this dialogue meets. The dialogues are kind of like plays that uh, Plato wrote where he has people discussing philosophical issues and people taking different positions on them. It ends up he has an argument that is intended to show that there's a problem with the divine command theory. So some people reject this out of hand. I actually think that the, uh, and it's a very interesting question, but I think that the argument is a bad argument. But setting that aside, this this argument, this one certainly is not going to help. This theory is not going to help us figure out what is right or wrong in the Charlie example. Now, maybe we could appeal to, remember, I was talking about the Declaration of Independence, natural rights. That is, that's part of we. And, and I, I should have mentioned when we're talking about the divine command theory, they're atheists. They don't think there is a God. So this certainly isn't going to, isn't going to be a theory that appeals to them. It's certainly not going to be a convincing theory. Whether, in fact, it's correct or not, that's another story. But natural rights is a concept that certainly seems to, uh, well, it doesn't go back to Aristotle, but it was it's Aristotelian in that uh, Aristotle thought that everything in nature had a certain purpose. And based on the per, if, if you were doing things in accordance with the purpose, the goal that that thing had, you were following the dictates of nature, and people picked up this idea, um, certainly Thomas Aquinas, or, you know, or some early uh, Christian scholars picked up, the, uh, picked up the idea, as did other religious scholars, that there were just natural rights. That is, you don't have to wait for God to come and tell you what to do, but just by looking around at nature, you can see what was, what's a natural action, what's not a natural action, and based on that, you can figure out that an action is right if and only if it doesn't violate anyone's natural rights. Now, again, it's kind of hard to figure out what your natural rights are. There are many people who deny that there are any natural rights. And there are, there are kind of problematic issues that are, that are wrapped up with this. Doesn't mean that the theory is wrong, but th there are some serious problems. In fact, people used to argue against various practices that they personally found distasteful, they didn't like, and they would say that it goes against nature. One big issue has to do with, you know, homosexual relations. It, many people deem that homosexuality was wrong because it's not natural. It's not the way things ought to to be, that nature wanted things to be, not God, but nature wanted things to be. Uh, it's kind of a very controversial doctrine, and it certainly, it's certainly kind of tough to see where it is. But as I mentioned, it's something that Thomas Jefferson seemed to be appealing to one of these two theories, and he got certainly the natural rights aspect from 
um, from John Locke, the philosopher John Locke. In fact, he the in the Declaration of Independence he says that our unalien our unalienable rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, it was life and liberty, according to John Locke, and property. And it could very well be, this is my own speculation, not based on any study of history. Somebody can tell me whether I'm right or wrong. But it could have been that uh, Jefferson intended to use that concept of property, that people are entitled to their property, but because of some difficulties he might run into in getting people to agree to the Declaration of Independence uh, in Philadelphia, he had to, especially people from the South where slavery was a dominant um, a dominant practice uh, and, and found to be perfectly okay, he might have been concerned about that people up north would be alienated because the people down south thought that property included people which you, which you couldn't really uh, own. Jefferson, including them, was a, a slave owner. Hard to, hard to kind of uh, understand where, where, where he was thinking, how he could defend this theory, uh, defend John Locke's position, and nonetheless be a slaveholder. But that's a, that's a whole other story a whole nother, for a whole other course. But we have this natural rights theory. The question is, really, what are our natural rights? Today, an issue, if we're thinking about it, is uh, we hear talk in the political environment about rights to health care. On the the left, everybody says everybody has a right to certain kinds of health care. And on that was on the left, on the right, people think health care is not a right. Perhaps it's something nice to do for people. Perhaps it it's morally required for another reason, but it's not a right. So it's it's and further even furthermore, the question in this case is does natural rights really give us a solution to our trolley problem? Is that that's one problem we're hoping any of these moral theories will solve? I mean, does do you have the natural right not you know not to have the person turn the trolley and hit you, uh, or is the natural yet yeah, the people have a natural right to have somebody do the thing that's going to minimize the number of people that died? I mean, it's hard to see exactly how it's it's applied, and it's hard to see where do these natural rights come from. And there are other theories that might explain that. But now let's move on to another theory that was intended to give an answer to the question, namely the theory that we're going to embark on first, uh, uh, embark uh, uh, on studying first, is utilitarianism, sometimes known as consequentialism. Um, It's also a version of what's known as hedonism, that it has to do with pleasure and pain, and a way of summarizing utilitarianism, at least for now. We're going to get into this in more detail when we study John Stuart Mill very shortly. But the criterion of morality is that an action is right if and only if it has the best consequences for everyone. The best consequences, meaning better consequences than any alternative actions that could have been taken, and best in terms of the consequences being having more pleasure versus pain, and who counts, everyone counts. And in fact, pleasure and pain is very important in this theory. And um, you, and then the question is, who counts as everyone? And in fact, in modern times, in this century, there's a, a famous philosopher named Peter Singer um, who wrote a book on animal rights. He was a utilitarian, and he said, it's not just limited to people, It's any sentient being, any being that can feel pain and pleasure, you know, the best consequences include the pain and pleasure of animal. And hence he got animal rights. So in this way, he was trying to explain what rights you really have, but in in utilitarian terms. So we'll be studying that theory. And maybe it's going to tell you, and if you take a look, I guess the question, in fact, I'm giving you this question to think about, the way you're hearing about utilitarianism now which of those two principles that we have, that inconsistent principles, which of them do you think is going to be right according to utilitarianism and which is going to be wrong? I'll put up a discussion board. I'd like to hear what you guys think about that. Next, we're going to move on to the kind of theory that's proposed by Immanuel Kant, known as a deontological theory or deontology, which 
basically is based on the idea, sometimes known as a duty-based ethics or a rule-based ethics. That is, it's based on a set of rules, but what the rules do, the rules are the ones that define what your duties are. And it claims that an action is right if and only if it conforms to the duties of the person acting. That is, everybody has certain duties. The issue is how to determine the duties, and Kant gives us an answer to that one. One way of thinking about a version of deontology, not as good as Kant's, but sort of a precursor one is the one that you were taught when you were three years old, probably, uh, when somebody told you, don't do that because you should do unto others, you should treat others and you'd ha- as you'd have them do unto you, as you would like to be treated. And that's what you do. That defines your general duty as a person, sometimes known as the golden rule. So the golden rule ethics is a deontological form of ethics. And again, going to ask you, to in the discussion board for the class say hey which principle do you think will be supported by deontology now finally i want to mention another theory another and this theory perhaps is associated with uh, thomas hobbes actually a a british philosopher before John Locke in the early 1600s, I believe. Uh, he lived late late 1500s, early 1600s. Um, and you might have heard of the social contract. Well, according to Ho- both Hobbes and Locke talked about where governments get their rights in the sphere of political uh, philosophy, where government gets their rights. And they talked about starting in a state of nature and figuring out how these rights come about and starting the, Thomas Hobbes, the earlier philosophy started, said, well, here, in the state of nature where there is no government, there is no right or wrong. Ultimately, what makes right or wrong is for, uh, for certain actions become right or wrong because these actions conform to the rules that everybody has agreed to, that there, uh, there is a social contract. Now, there are this is an interesting theory. It's a theory that P have has that people have defended today. I think there are some problems for it, but we're going to see. It seems to be applicable. But the question is, what are our contractual obligations? And if we go back to the trolley examples, well, maybe pushing the fat guy off the bridge is is that you know that's an act of murder. Um, how about turning the trolley? It's not clear how this, how this kind of theory answers it. But what I just want to do is give you an overview of some of the major modern uh, moral theories, moral philosophies, to see where we're going. And we're going to see, we're going to really dive down into utilitarianism and, and deontology to understand how they try to provide a theory that's going to justify one of these moral principles rather than the other.